Hi, Dubai. Okay, everyone. Our mission is to provide complete balanced nutrition for strength and energy. Yay! Ensure complete balanced nutrition with 27 vitamins and minerals and ensure complete with 30 grams of protein. Dawn is flipping the way America does dishes. Dawn Platinum Easy Squeeze. It's an upside down bottle with no cap. Just grab, squeeze, and Platinum's formula breaks down grease faster. Tackle grease wherever it shows up. No flip, no mess. Dawn Easy Squeeze. Tomorrow on ET, our Vince Gill exclusive, his first interview since wife Amy Grant's bike accident. The best thing for her to do is just be still. Yes, sometimes that's the best thing for yes. everybody. Just be still and heal, Amy. Now, before we go, one last Emmy highlight. Big congrats to the Gina Davis Institute of Gender and Media, who took home this year's Governor's Award. We made a great deal of happening now. When I arrived, um, I remember her being really upset. Coming up, day two of sentencing. Former employees of Michelle Barrientes Vela describe a law enforcement agency in turmoil. And we have a few showers to take a look at on the radar screen this afternoon. We'll do that and talk about rain chances the rest of the week. An updated look at lake levels in just a bit. How the San Antonio Food Bank has helped a single mother of three fight inflation and what inspired her to give back to her east side neighborhood. The News at 5 starts now. And we begin with breaking news out of Houston, where former federal judge and Baylor University president and chancellor Kenneth Starr has died at the age of 76. Starr's family releasing a statement today, in part saying that he died as a result of complications from surgery. Starr nominated by former President Ronald Reagan for a seat on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Washington, D.C. Circuit. But perhaps he is best known for his role as independent counsel in the former President Bill Clinton, Monica Lewinsky investigation. We are going to have more information on Kenneth Starr as details become available on his death. You can look for updates both on air and online. Into the courtroom now where the hits against convicted ex-constable Michelle Barrientes Vela continue during day two of her sentencing. She was described as a chaotic leader who served herself above others. Dylan Collier live in downtown with how the list of abuses of power could go a long way toward convincing a judge to sentence her to prison. Yeah, from officer intimidation to ordering her own personnel to freeze out their fellow deputies, the state continues to build a pretty strong case that Michelle Barrientes Vela operated with a bully mentality. The ex-constable faces between two years probation and 10 years in prison after being convicted of tampering with records. A lineup of Precinct 2 deputies, both current and former, took the stand throughout the day detailing odd behavior from the former county leader. In one instance, she revoked the work permits of a deputy after he spoke to two deputies that had been blackballed by the agency. In another incident, the then constable showed up at a West Side discount store and ordered several other deputies to respond as well. Her son had been accused of shoplifting. Deputies arrived. They witnessed Barrientes Vela interrogate the manager who was on duty. One deputy testified that the constable was so upset on the radio, they believed she was involved in an emergency. When we get into something, you can hear the change in our voices and her voice, you can tell something was wrong. This portion of sentencing is scheduled to conclude this evening. The sentencing hearing will resume in early October. There's a three-week pause due to scheduling conflicts in the court. The state at this point is about halfway in calling its witnesses through its witness list. Reporting live downtown, Dylan Call, your KSAT 12 News. Much thanks, Dylan. New at five, one person now recovering, two others in custody after police say that a road rage incident turned into a stabbing. It happened earlier this afternoon on the city's south side when a driver cut off another driver on South Zarzamora. The drivers ended up in the parking lot at South Park Mall. Police say one of them pulled out a knife and slashed the other in the neck. That person in the hospital, we are told he is doing okay. The two other suspects who were arrested are still being questioned by police. In an hour, the Uvalde City Council will be meeting. One of the biggest agenda items we're watching tonight, updating cemetery ordinances for the Robb Elementary victims. Families of the victims are asking for the ordinance to be amended so their loved ones can have standing headstones. 
According to an agenda document, it's been decided this can move forward as long as the headstones are no taller than 24 inches total. Kimberly Rubio, Lexi Rubio's mother, has been leading the charge to make this change happen. At the August 23rd City Council meeting, Rubio made it clear this was a point she would fight on in memory of her daughter. It's also been brought to my attention that some community members oppose my request. Uh, to that I say, if your child wasn't murdered in her fourth grade classroom, your opposition doesn't count. Yeah. Rubio won't be at tonight's meeting. She's having someone read a statement in her place. Coming up at 6, the Valley City Council also discussing some new police requirements. We're going to tell you exactly what they are coming up in about 48 minutes. Election Day. It's now a holiday for teachers and students at Northeast ISD. That's after the District Board of Trustees voted to make that happen last night. It also means the last day of school for campuses that follow the traditional district calendar has been pushed back one day. Students who attend an extended campus year, or extended school year campus rather, or a year round campus are going to have to make up that day scheduled at a later date. The district says the decision to make the election day a holiday was made with the security and safety of students and staff and visitors in mind. It can be an issue because the Texas election code requires that public buildings, including schools, be made available for use as a polling place. We'll have more on this story coming up next on KSA 12 News at 6. It's often talked about but rarely realized. Getting out the youth vote, though, seems to be gaining momentum at universities around the country, including Texas A&M San Antonio. Move Texas is one organization already responsible for registering hundreds to vote in past elections, and it's now collaborating with the university for the midterms. Tiffany Huertas explains how students are motivated by top issues. I registered to vote in 2019. When it comes to voting, Texas A&M University San Antonio student Ramon Orendine cares about several issues. I care about the environment um, and making sure that we can all live in peace and this world. Ramon welcomes organizations like Move Texas that promotes voter registration on campus. Voting is, is critical. Move Texas became a student organization here at Texas A&M University San Antonio last year and has since registered hundreds of students to vote. I'm out here every day registering folks. Dylan Villalon with Move Texas leads the student organization and says issues students care about include climate change, issues like women's rights, issues like criminal justice. In 2020, Move Texas says it registered over 50,000 new young voters. I encourage students to get educated about voting, to really learn the importance of their votes, because a lot of the issues that students face right now are systemic issues, and voting is the only systemic solution we have right now to a lot of the issues that we face. The university's May Center for Experiential Learning and Community Engagement has been collaborating with Move Texas. They've passed out information about early voting deadlines, National Voter Registration Day, Election Day, and more. I think it's just really important to make sure that the student's voice uh, is heard. With November's midterm elections coming up, Dylan hopes to motivate young voters to participate. Come see me between now and Election Day to get educated on what's going to be on the ballot. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. Check out traffic on this Tuesday, five minutes after five, and you can see heavy traffic. This is I-35 at San Marcos moving north of town, and you can see it is very, very heavy in the northbound lanes. And we've got a little bit of radar activity out there right now. This is that 10% chance that we were talking about, mostly in Gonzales and Gonzales County. Look over the past hour, and that's where the radar has been lit up. Even a bit of lightning associated with it. Those are those white lines that you see there indicating the cloud to ground lightning strikes. Now this action is pushing this outflow boundary, this green line westward into Guadalupe County, Seguin area, and it's likely to make it into Bear County. It could be just enough to kickstart a few more thunderstorms over the next couple of hours. So that's something we'll be watching. Otherwise, locally, really not a lot to talk about around here. A few patchy clouds, and we just tried to pop a shower here around Bulverde, but you can see not much success even around Fisher and Canyon Lake over the past hour. There was an attempt by the atmosphere, but a fairly unsuccessful attempt. And just north of Pipe Creek, a bit of activity as well on the Bandera County line. All right, taking a look at our temperatures out there. Weather watchers for the most part in the low to mid 90s, 94 in Shirts and Seguin, 92 in Mico, 93 in Lavernian. As we go through the evening, those showers coming to an end by 
by sunset and temperatures gradually falling through the 80s. Updated lake levels in just a bit. Thank you, Adam. Well, some other top stories we're following for you. San Antonio Police and Crime Stoppers asking for help in solving a robbery at a Walmart. It happened just a few days ago on September 9th near Bandera Road in West Woodlawn Avenue on the northwest side. Officers say a man walked into the store, grabbed several items and then tried to leave. A security guard, though, tried to handcuff him instead. Police say the man, though, turned around and flashed a knife, and the security guard let him go. If you know anything that can help police solve either of these cases, call Crime Stoppers at the number on your screen, 210-224-STOP. You could receive a reward of up to $5,000 for information that leads to an arrest. Cleanup now underway following a fire that tore through an east side home, emptying a family and their pets onto the street. It all unfolded around 430 in the morning on Hayes Street, not too far from the AT&T Center. Crews say two people, five dogs and two cats were inside the house when it went up in flames. No one was hurt, but at least one of those pets had to be given oxygen. At this time, it's still unclear what exactly sparked the flames at this home. Right now, the Red Cross helping the couple and those pets. Still ahead on the News at 5, health officials confirming there has been the first monkeypox related death in the U.S. We're going to tell you where that case is from and what else may have contributed to their death. And September is Hunger Action Month, the time to help those who worry about where their food will come from. We're going to share the story of a local mother who's crediting the food bank for inspiring her to help others. I'm Myra Arthur with a look at what's coming up on the news at 6 o'clock today. Blood centers across the nation face supply shortages, but the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center says it's prepared to help respond to nationwide tragedies. For the past year, the local blood center has worked with the national program Blood Emergency Readiness Corps, or BERC, to help keep the blood supply steady and stable. Coming up at 6, how this program works and the current need for donors. A mother seeking justice as her son's killer could possibly be released from jail tomorrow. Ana Maria Carpio speaks about the upcoming hearing for the teen who shot and killed, who killed her son, Sebastian. Erica Hernandez gives us insight to what this hearing is all about and why Ana Maria believes this teen should not be given a second chance. And it's not a new fence or security system, but one major school district in San Antonio taking a unique step towards school safety. How Northeast ISD's board is trying to make election day safer for students and teachers. We're going to dive a little bit deeper into that today at 6. We'll see you then. Thank you, Myra. Health officials have now confirmed the first known monkeypox death in the U.S. The CDC says it is a person in Los Angeles County, California, who died after being hospitalized with the virus. They say that that person had a weakened immune system. A person with monkeypox in the Houston area also died last month, but officials have not confirmed the virus's role in that death. September Hunger Action Month. The San Antonio Food Bank says the need is greater than ever in our community because of inflation. The nonprofit serving more than 100,000 people each week. And that's 10,000 more people a week since 2021. Sarah Costa spoke with a single mom of three who says it was the hope that the food bank gave her that inspired her to give back to others. I was hopeless. Hopeless and lost. It's how Mari Morales felt a year ago, faced with inflation. As she watched the food supplies in her home run out, she knew she needed to keep her 11-year-old son and 10-year-old twins fed. I was in desperate need of feeding my family. I am a single mother of three kids. So having to meet their needs was vital for me. So she turned to the San Antonio Food Bank, getting in line in one of their south side distribution locations. And when she got home, her family was overwhelmed with the food they received. When we received everything that was given to us, it was more than enough. That inspired her to give back. She says they gathered some of their extra food they received and shared it with their neighbors. Seeing that need and gratification, she took it to another level, partnering with the San Antonio Food Bank to hold food distributions in her neighborhood every other Tuesday. 
She wants those in her community to know that it's okay to ask for help. It doesn't matter your social status. It doesn't matter if you feel, well, do I need this? Or are there others who need it more than I do? It's here for everyone. She says her family has been distributing food in her east side neighborhood for a year now and hopes that others in the community who can help are inspired to step up not just this month, but all year long. So if you're on the other side of this need and you can give, do that. Together we can fight this hunger and feed hope. Madi will share more of her story tomorrow during our KSAC Community Town Hall Faces of Hunger. Max Massey and I will host a live stream starting at 2 p.m. talking with the San Antonio Food Bank about the programs the nonprofit is offering, the need the nonprofit is seeing because of inflation, and how you can help out. Watch it tomorrow on KSAT.com, our streaming app, KSAT Plus, and our YouTube channel. Thank you, Sarah. Fight hunger, feed hope. I like that. Looking at the Alamo, beautiful day out there. Just in the low 90s, not too bad. No, not too bad temperature wise. I believe our average high now is down to 91 degrees. We're on the downward trend, climatologically speaking, when it comes to our high temperature. So let's take a look at the radar. We talked a little bit earlier about Gonzales County. That's where most of the action has been lately. And you look at the radar estimates over the past 12 hours, and we've seen some decent pockets of rain, especially just to the east of the city of Gonzales. These green areas indicating between one and two inches of rain, even 1.3 right along Highway 90 there. That's nice. And then south of Highway uh, 83, that's where we have 1.2 inches estimated by the Doppler radar. So it's nice to see that out there. Uh, these are the rainfall estimates from today and really not a whole lot of action out there, but it's better than nothing. And of course, we will take whatever we can get our hands on. And we still have one active downpour, a pretty heavy downpour right on the Kerr County, Bandera County line and even right on the uh, the Kendall County line with uh, Bandera County. This is just north of Pipe Creek and north of the city of Bandera. No lightning associated with it, at least not now. This is just kind of drifting its way to the southwest and changing its, its shape and intensity quite a bit just over a short period of time. Otherwise, not a lot to talk about. Some action in northern Kendall County and a few isolated hits in Kerr County. But I do want to point out we have this outflow boundary uh, right here. I'm going to draw it. This line right here. That's the outflow boundary, the wind being pushed out of the collapsed thunderstorms that were off in Gonzales County, and that's moving eastward at about 15 to 20 miles per hour. So that could even make it into eastern San Antonio and the far east side of town within about the next hour and a half or so. And the reason I point that out is sometimes these outflow boundaries are just enough to kickstart another shower or two. So there is that possibility. It's an off chance, a possibility, not a probability of seeing a shower from that outflow boundary. West Texas, seen more action today. It's good to see that. West Texas was very dry the monsoon season. This summer was very good to West Texas. And speaking of monsoon season, I mean, we're talking desert southwest all the way up the Rockies here. That's where the moisture is. It's coming off the Pacific Ocean and it's wedged between the low pressure system over Washington State and the upper level high, a weak one that's over the central plains. For us, no major weather features like that to really funnel the moisture in and kickstart our atmosphere, but still minor chances of rain. Kind of like what we have out there today, uh, about a 10 to 20 percent chance going forward. I don't think so tomorrow, but Thursday through the weekend and into next week. As for area reservoir levels, of course, there's a lot listed here. We don't have time to list off all of them, but what stands out, of course, Medina, 8% full, 76 feet below the conservation pool, and that's 34 feet lower than what we had this time last year. Uh, Canyon, 87% full, that's six and a half feet below conservation. Even Buchanan at 67%, and that's about 14 feet below the conservation pool. We put a big dent in our drought, but we can obviously use more rain for the drought and the area lakes and reservoirs. Right now, 93, dew point is 63, 88 Carrizo Springs, 95 in New Braunfels, 90 in Rio Medina, Converse 92. Look at Gonzales at 79 because of the rain cooled air. Meanwhile, we're in the low 90s in Bear County. So by tomorrow morning, 73 degrees at 7 a.m. By the noon hour, we're talking 87 degrees, a lot of sunshine throughout the day tomorrow. I'd be surprised if we see any of those isolated showers pop up. I think a better chance of seeing some of those Thursday 
and all through the weekend and into next week, but not much coverage. High temperatures tomorrow, 91 Uvalde, 94 Gonzales, 93 Canyon Lake, Von Army 93 and Lavernia 94 and temperatures really aren't going to change a whole lot in the days ahead. Afternoon highs low to mid 90s and just those kind of minimal rain chances that do get a little bit higher the closer you are to the Gulf Coast. Thank you, Adam. All right, we've got an update on when DAC may be back. Yeah, uh, the cloud that is hanging over the Dallas Cowboys yeah. as we speak, there is a very little ray of sunshine piercing through that. When we come back, that's because the owner of the Dallas Cowboys says we could expect him back sooner than later. We'll update the time that he may be away from the game and also the owner of the Phoenix Suns suspended and fined millions of dollars coming up. Pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. Dallas Cowboys depressing season opening 93 loss to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers just got a smidge brighter after what Cowboys owner Jerry Jones had to say today. Dak underwent surgery to repair a fracture on his right thumb and his throwing hand that he picked up late in the fourth quarter. The worst performance since he was a rookie on Sunday Night Football. Shaq Barrett was on the pass defense when he bent back Dak's right hand causing the injury but following the operation Jerry Jones appearing on his weekly radio show in Dallas today believes the timeline for Prescott's return may be more like two to three weeks rather than six to eight weeks. If we thought he wasn't going to be ready to go for uh, four games until after four games, we would put him on IR. We're not doing that. We think he can come in and play, so we don't want to uh, not have him out there practicing. We want him uh, getting prepared, and we'll see how he uh, handles this thing, how it um, heals, mainly how he can, uh, his strength, how he can grip the ball, what his status is. Uh, but that's not being an optimist. The proof is that uh, we got a good surgery, got good technique, and uh, feel uh, better about it than we did uh, Sunday night. Now, for now, Cooper Rush will step in when the Cowboys host the Cincinnati Bengals this Sunday afternoon at 325. The Houston Texans didn't win their season opener, but they didn't lose it in their debut against the Indianapolis Colts just because the game ended in a 2020 tie. The big question after the game is why didn't the Texans go for it on fourth down and three with 26 seconds in overtime after Rex Burkhead was stuffed on third and one? There's a lot of football left to go in the season. It's kind of simple as that. I feel like a tie was better than a potential loss. Defensively, we weren't really stopping them off a lot there at the end. And true to their word, the Houston Texans hosted every member of the Uvalde football team for their season opener to help cheer them on on Sunday. The owner of both the Phoenix Suns of the NBA and the Phoenix Mercury of the WNBA, Robert Sarver, has been suspended for one year and fined the maximum $10 million after an investigation found he clearly violated workplace standards. The independent investigation found that Sarver used the N-word at least five times in recounting the statements of others, engaging in equitable conduct towards female employees, making many sexually related comments in the workplace that included inappropriate comments about the physical appearance of female employees and other women, and on several occasions engaged in inappropriate physical conduct toward male employees. Employees. The suspension means he cannot appear at any of the team's facilities or have any involvement in the business operations of the teams and cannot make any appearance representing the teams. Coming up at 6 o'clock, what UTSA is preparing for in light of the fact that Texas Longhorns don't have two of their top quarterbacks ready to play. We've got that for you coming up at 6. All right. It's going to be an angry Longhorn team. Yes, it will be. It. Yes, but maybe not a full Longhorn team. We'll yeah. see. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Greg. We'll be right back. Thanks so much for watching the news at five with us. World News Up next. We'll see you back here at six.